Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark, the fast and affordable VPN service. I'll explain more about them a little later. Our understanding of what was actually going on here has changed dramatically since the late great Klaus Schmidt first decided to take a punt on a barren, supposedly unpromising hilltop. And it's this changing picture that we're going to explore in this video. Gebekli Tepe is in the southeastern part of modern-day Turkey, on the highest point of the Jermis Mountains, overlooking the Haran Plain and a tributary of the Euphrates. The area around Gebekli Tepe is known as the Urfa or Stone Hills region, and the earliest known evidence of permanent human settlement has been found here. Since Klaus Schmidt first rediscovered the site, debate has raged over its absolute chronology, with Schmidt insisting that the monument was built much earlier than the available evidence seemed to suggest. This debate now seems to have been resolved. The earliest phases of the site are firmly dated to the latter part of the period known as the Pre-Pottery Neolithic A, or PPNA. This is a stretch of time between 9600 and 8800 BCE, just prior to the invention of pottery. This is a transitional period when most people still moved in highly mobile hunter-gatherer groups, but some evidence of permanent settlements and the beginnings of agriculture begins to appear. The later phases of construction are dated to PPNB between 8800 and 7000 BCE. The earlier PPNA period is identified as originating from the Mesolithic Natufian culture. In this region, the Mesolithic period is considered to stretch between 18,000 and approximately 10,000 BCE. The later PPNB cultures have a similar origin but are considered separately as their material culture suggests an influx of Levantine peoples from further north. Of course, only about 5 to 10% of the site has been excavated. So everything is still very much up for grabs, including the possibility that a much earlier dating may be found later on. For now, though, all available evidence tells us that Gebekli Tepe is a late PPNA monument. This makes sense, as the PPNA period is characterized by permanent settlements occasionally containing large stone monuments. Gebekli Tepe covers 9 hectares and is roughly 300 meters in diameter. The mound in which the monument stands is a man-made hill 15 meters in height. The older PPNA construction is made up of circular enclosures between 10 and 20 meters in diameter, connected by limestone walls with benches set against them. Each circular enclosure contains a pair of five meter tall pillars in the center, mounted in some sort of circular structure and surrounded by smaller pillars. Each enclosure also seems to contain a communal building of a kind typical of the area. The two big central pillars are almost certainly depictions of male humans. The probable gender of these pillars is based on comparison to other very similar pillars in the surrounding area. This T-shaped style of pillar is unique to the Urfa region, but is repeated at a number of nearby sites of a similar period. In these other sites, both men and women are represented, but only males are ever depicted wearing belts. The central pillars in Gebekli Tepe are all wearing belts, which strongly suggests that they're all male. Fox bones were also found at the bottom of one pillar, which depicts a man in what is possibly fox fur, indicating that perhaps it was decorated with real skin at some point, or possibly offered as part of a ritual. Other pillars in the enclosures have highly skillful relief carvings of a variety of animals, including snakes, foxes, cranes, storks, boars, gazelles, and aurochs, a wild cow, which was the extinct ancestor of our domestic varieties. There are also multiple representations of predators and, quite famously, vultures and scorpions. The consistency and quality of these carvings indicates that a more or less professional artisan class existed, as most archaeologists agree that the artwork is far too good to have been done on spur of the moment by untrained individuals. Amongst all all these animals are some abstract geometric symbols, some astonishingly skillful sculptures in deep relief, representations of people, some headless interacting with animals, each other or themselves, and even a later graffiti of female genitalia. This is the only female representation on the site, and it's not considered original. For whatever reason, Gebekli Tepe is a very male space, with a multitude of representations of erect penises. Gebekli Tepe is a multi-layered site, and in archaeology this is called a palimpsest. Now you know. The earliest PPNA level is called Layer 3, and it overlaid above this is the PPNB site, made about a thousand years later. Here the enclosures have shrunk somewhat, and have transitioned from circular to rectangular. The workmanship seems to have degraded somewhat, and most of these later enclosures are also smaller and contain only the two central pillars, also on a much smaller scale, generally being 1.5 meters high. It used to be believed that at some point in the Neolithic, the users of Gebekli Tepe, for some mysterious reason, buried the entire monument hiding it from view for thousands of years. 
That is not the current consensus among archaeologists. This part of Anatolia is very earthquake prone, and the site sits in a sort of hollow at the top of its plateau. According to Jens Nortreff, one of the archaeologists on the site, the stratigraphy of the top of the mound, layer 1, is extremely complicated. While there are some clear signs of deliberate burial, these only seem to come up to the crossbars of the T-shaped pillars. Quite a lot of the rest of the backfill appears to be natural, so this story seems to be more complex, stretching over a much longer time than originally thought. Very little of this interpretation is definite, however. It's just the most plausible theory that exists right now. And this is a theme with Gebekli Tepe. What did all these animals mean? Why did the enclosures transition from circular to rectangular? Why the seeming reduction in quality of workmanship? Why does the site exist at all? And the answer is that nobody really knows. There's a bunch of theories, though, so shall we have a look at some of them? So, do you worry about your safety online? Well then, what you need is a fast and affordable VPN service that protects you while you browse. And that's where our sponsor, Surfshark, can help. Their VPN service keeps your online activity safe and private by encrypting all your data. When you connect to the internet, Surfshark stops anyone from being able to snoop on you, making sure that no one can see what you're doing or where you're connecting from, ensuring all your personal details stay safe. A quote from them that I love is that using their VPN is like wearing pants. When you go outside, all the important stuff stays private and secure. Look, Surfshark also lets you travel the virtual world. They've got more than 3,200 servers in 100 different countries, so you'll always be able to find one that suits your needs. No longer will you be frustrated by not being able to stream your favorite shows because of silly geo restrictions. Simply connect to a server where the content is available and enjoy. This feature also lets you find the best deals when online shopping. Don't let websites show you higher prices just because of your location or the device you're connected from. Turn on Surfshark VPN and you can be sure you're going to get the best price. Surfshark doesn't only protect you, they also give you the most unrestricted browsing experience. But it's also extremely affordable. Get Surfshark VPN now at surfshark.deal slash mega and enter the promo code mega for an amazing 83% off and three extra months for free. Don't miss this great opportunity to stay safe on the internet and let's get back to today's video. When Klaus Schmidt first began excavating the site, he came to the very reasonable conclusion that the effort required to create something of this size must have been motivated by ritual or religious reasons. This is a pretty safe theory for most monumental construction of the ancient past, and it matches up nicely with the later monumental structures that we actually have written records for. So when he declared Gebekli Tepe as the world's first temple, this seemed pretty reasonable at the time. Recent discoveries, however, have cast doubt on this idea. While it's almost certain that Gebekli Tepe had a religious function, it's probably not a dedicated temple, and it's definitely not one of the first of its kind. Karahan Tepe, found nearby, is 300 years older than Gebekli Tepe and bears many of the same hallmarks. Its construction is obviously different, using wood rather than stone and containing a different style of figures, but the basic idea of connected enclosures and animal and human iconography makes it very clear to archaeologists that Karahan Tepe represents a stage in the evolution of monumental sites in this area, leading eventually to the massive pillars and pits of Gebekli Tepe. While nobody has any serious problems with the site as a place of worship, what's more questionable is the idea that it was just purely a religious site. Schmidt wasn't able to find good evidence for contemporaneous permanent settlement anywhere near Gebekli Tepe. As far as his team could make out, there was no reliable water source, there were no burials, and this view colored their interpretation of much of the evidence. Schmidt's assumption was that if nobody was living at or near the site, then they must have only returned seasonally in order to perform sacred rituals, but to be fair, nothing else really fits very well with the picture that he had. Schmidt unfortunately died in 2014, so he wasn't able to see the subsequent work which cast a new light on some of these issues. While he had noted substantial rainwater storage systems on the site, this still chimed in his mind with temporary occupation rather than permanent settlements. What he didn't know, however, was that climatic analysis of the area would uncover the fact that the water table was much higher in the Neolithic period, and that this makes it likely that the dried out springs nearby would have been active at the time that Gebekli Tepe was in use. This means that archaeologists are now looking at the site as more of a hybrid or multi-use site, which makes more sense as areas where the sacred is mixed with the mundane are much more typical of the Neolithic period. The main pillar pun intended, of the ancient temple theory is the amount of labor required to build Gebekli Tepe. 
Schmidt made labor estimates based on the experiments done with the giant heads, or moai, of Easter Islands, which found that hundreds of workers would have been required. Experiments on the actual site of Gebekli Tepe, however, using period-appropriate materials and tools, found that even the largest pillars could have been quarried and constructed by 10 to 14 people. This, remember, is also the number of people who could comfortably fit in the site's communal buildings, and seems to suggest a somewhat more domestic, though still sacred purpose, for these structures. There's a lot of animal bones at Gebekli Tepe, a whole hell of a lot of them. This has led some archaeologists to surmise that groups of hunter-gatherers came periodically as working parties and were subsequently treated to enormously lavish feasts, either as part of ritual practice or as a reward for their labor, or maybe for both. Schmidt himself thought that these mass barbecues may have been part of a seasonal pattern of ritual sacrifice, which would gel with his ancient temple theory. The fact that all the remains were wild animals, being mainly aurochs and gazelle, and that no traces of domesticated grain were discovered on the site has been interpreted as evidence that Gebekli Tepe was exclusively a seasonal resort for nomadic hunter-gatherers. There are problems with this, however. The first is that the lack of domesticated animal or plant species isn't diagnostic in this period. Becoming settled Neolithic farmers was a process which took thousands of years, and it's entirely possible that some experiments with settlement could have occurred here. In fact, for the Natufian sites around Gebekli Tepe, which are even earlier, this is exactly what's been found. Developing agriculture was not this quick or sudden development, so it's possible that Gebekli Tepe represents a transitional phase where wild animals were being managed rather than herded, and wild cereals, whilst being planted and harvested, had not yet developed into their domesticated varieties. Having said all of this, ritual or secular feasting is still one of the most valid and plausible theories, but as we'll see, there are good reasons to think that other things were going on as well. In 2017, a pair of chemical engineers called Martin Sweatman and Dimitrios Sikitritis from the University of Edinburgh released a groundbreaking paper claiming that they had strong evidence for Gebekli Tepe being an ancient astronomical observatory. In it, they said that they'd used advanced data analytics to determine that the pillars were lined up with important constellations and that relief sculptures on these pillars lined up with the astrocisms or star signs associated with those animals. They also suggested that Pillar 43, which depicts a vulture and a headless person, was a record of the younger Dras comet impact. This caused a sensation in both the media and academic circles, with the merits of the paper being hotly debated among scholars and lay people alike. Their paper so caught the public imagination that it's still heavily quoted in so-called alternative archaeology circles to this day, and Dr. Sweatman appeared in Graham Hancock's highly problematic Ancient Apocalypse Netflix series to push his claims. There are, however, very serious issues with this interpretation. Firstly, there's the fact that the key assumption of the analysis is that one of the pillars depicting a scorpion actually represents the star sign Scorpius. There is no evidence to support this, and it is cited in the paper as a starting assumption. Archaeologists and anthropologists believe this to be highly questionable. The builders of Gebekli Tepe left no written records, and it's highly unlikely that we'll ever know what any of the animal symbols actually mean. Additionally, it's also highly unlikely that the interpretation of the Scorpius constellation was transmitted unchanged over so many thousands of years. And even if it was, there's no evidence whatsoever that this particular Scorpion sculpture actually represents it. What about the fact that the data analytics says that it lines up with the constellation? Well, the fact is that it doesn't, really. The pillars in Gebekli Tepe are footed on no more than 20 centimeters of bedrock, and there's ample evidence that they were moved multiple times by the users of the site. This puts serious stress on the idea that they were affixed with astronomical alignments in mind, not to mention the fact that nobody's really 100% sure of their original position, so even if they do line up, which is questionable, this probably doesn't mean anything. On top of this, it's considered highly likely by the archaeological team, based on the T-shapes of the big pillars as well as comparison to other sites, that Gebekli Tepe had a roof. This would make it difficult to 
you know, look at the sky. There are issues with the statistical base as well. In 2017, less than 5% of the site had been excavated, and only part of this research had been published. So the sample of the pillar positions was not only based on an unsafe assumption, it was also so tiny that it couldn't possibly be considered diagnostic. It's also somewhat arbitrary, as there are far too many animals represented for the zodiac the Edinburgh engineers propose, and no satisfactory explanation for their selection of just a handful of them to form the basis of the theory has been made. As for the Younger Dryas comet impacts, there's major issues with that too. The Younger Dryas event was a period of drastic cooling which occurred after the end of the Ice Age. The establishment theory is that cold meltwater flooded into the ocean which caused a corresponding change in climate. More recent work has uncovered the very plausible possibility that a comet or comet fragment may have struck Greenland, causing a somewhat more sudden and catastrophic version of the Younger Dryas event. There's some good evidence for this, but it's still far from being conclusively proven. And given that we don't know if the Younger Dryas impact impact actually happened, it seems a bit much to claim that Pillar 43 depicts the event. This is especially true when we consider that there's a much simpler and more plausible theory for what's on the pillar. Fragments of modified skull have been found in Gobekli Tepe, suggesting an association with a very widespread Neolithic skull cult found in this area and across Europe. In sites nearby, there's evidence of flesh being removed from a body before burial. In both ancient and modern examples of this practice, vultures are an important part of the process, and depictions of these birds are frequently found at these so-called sky burial sites. Given evidence of a head cult, as well as definite knowledge of the surrounding culture being involved in this process, the dig team and their specialist anthropologists tentatively interpret the headless man and vulture on Pillar 43 as being associated with funerary practice. This isn't to say it's impossible that Gebekli Tepe was associated with ancient astronomy. In fact, given what we know about Neolithic people, most archaeologists acknowledge that it's more likely than not that something of this sort would have been going on. The problem is that there's no good evidence for it yet. Sweatman and Secretus's paper can't be used to interpret the site, as its fundamental assumptions and methodology are so unsound. So yeah, it's possible, even likely, that evidence of ancient astronomy will be found. It just hasn't been yet. There's a place at the site called the Rock Garden. This is basically a spoil heap where archaeologists dumped the many articles of worked stone they found for later examination. Very recently, an archaeologist called Laura Dietrich decided to perform a systematic analysis of the finds in the Rock Garden and was astonished to discover that it contains more than 10,000 querns or grinding stones and more than 650 stone vessels, some as big as 200 liters. According to Dietrich, this is the largest collection of grinders and vessels in the entire Near Eastern region. Querm stones are used to grind wheat into flour. The massive number of these present at Gebekli Tepe raises some serious questions, not least about the common assumption that the consumption of processed grain was a post-agriculture phenomenon. In fact, it's generally accepted now that ancient humans may have been eating processed carbs up to 100,000 years ago, which is potentially bad news for advocates of the famous paleo diet. Given uh, we already know that enormous feasts of meat took place at Gebekli Tepe, it makes sense that there be other foods being processed there as well. In the early days of the dig, it was thought that occasional production of beer and porridge might have occurred on the site, but the sheer scale of grinding equipment found actually suggests near industrial scale production, which significantly changes our picture of the site. Of course, the study of ancient plants is a difficult and enigmatic field. Grains and plant matter don't preserve as easily as bones do, and ancient peoples tended to use food for, well, eating, so they don't tend to leave much behind. More recently, however, pioneering archaeologists like Sultana Valamoti have developed methods for analyzing the burnt remains of meals, which have either clung to cooking vessels or been discarded in fire pits. At Gebekli Tepe, these methods have uncovered a thriving flour and beer production center, mostly using wild varieties varieties of iron corn wheat, the exact variety which was first domesticated in the nearby Fertile Crescent to bring about the Neolithic Revolution. The quantities suggested by the sheer number of grinding stones and massive stone vessels strongly indicates that even though these are wild varieties, some sort of cultivation might have been going on near the site. This has led some archaeologists to suggest that one of the functions of Gebekli Tepe may have been as sort of a food processing hub. Right down to modern times, people would bring grain to a central point to be ground, brewed, and baked, and it's plausible that Gebekli Tepe may have been one of those centers, along with or maybe a part of its sacred functions. There is a very long association between food being produced and religious activity, and Dietrich's discoveries seem to fit this pattern very well.
When the dig began in 1995 and Gebekli Tepe's amazing structures were first uncovered, it was heavily played up in the press and in some circles of academia as an anomaly, a history-breaking discovery which would upend everything we thought we knew about civilization. While this is very sensational, it wasn't really true then, and it isn't really true today. That's not to take away from the revolutionary nature of the site, it has rewritten important aspects of the story of civilization, but the fact is that Gebekli Tepe's wonder isn't born of anomaly, but rather from its being a spectacular example of a broader landscape of human habitation. At this stage, and likely far into the future, Gebekli Tepe's purpose is largely an enigma. But over the last 27 years of excavation, our picture of what was actually going on there has clarified significantly. The most favored theory at the present time is that Gebekli Tepe was a meeting place for highly mobile hunter-gatherer groups. The purposes of these meetings would almost certainly have included ritual or religious elements. We know for certain that the sacred was ever present in the daily lives of people at this time. But what's also likely is there were mundane and secular purposes behind the site as well. Archaeologists like Jens Notcheroff have carefully speculated that Gebekli Tepe may have been a landmark site built through communal effort by several different bands of hunter-gatherers. It's possible that the animal iconography might have represented the very various identities of totems of these groups, as the enclosures which we have uncovered seem to be organized loosely according to theme. It's possible that some of these groups were more settled than others, it's even possible that one or more groups may have permanently settled down on the harem plain below and begun experimenting with plant cultivation and rudimentary forms of animal management or animal husbandry, which would help to explain their atypical success at hunting. It's even possible, though unlikely, that some groups may have lived permanently in parts of the complex. There's no evidence for this as of yet but very little of the site has been excavated and other indications are causing some researchers to lean this way. There's also strong evidence to suggest that Gebekli Tepe may have been used as a funerary site as well. There are still many unanswered questions, however, and without knowing what other kinds of architecture are present in the other enclosures, more than 16 have been found through magnetic and radar surveys, it's still very difficult to know how the buildings and monuments already uncovered fit into the complex as a whole. As well as this, the whole question of the burial of the site is now called into question by new evidence, so the story of its final days are yet to be fully understood. Gebekli Tepe is an astonishingly rich and valuable site, and the dig, in archaeological terms, is still a very young one. So one thing we could say for sure is that Gebekli Tepe will continue to provide us with fascinating and intriguing insights into our deep past for many years to come.